to World War II TV, and we are continuing our Germans at War. Second week, we did the first week in May and the second week in June. And today, we are kind of continuing a theme we started with our guest back when he talked about tank use in the Spanish Civil War. But we're moving, nudging into World War II today. And we're talking about the recycling of older or obsolescent vehicles and how the German army were, were using the vehicles from captured countries, recycling and re-equipping their older vehicles. And we're going to use a particular type, the Panzer 38, as an example. So before I bring in my guest, I just, as always, remind you to think about becoming a subscriber of the channel so you get the notifications of new shows. Consider becoming a patron. Consider becoming a YouTube channel member. And all the links you need are in the description below. So the social media links, links to my guests, social media accounts, books, if they've written them, et cetera, et cetera, is all down there. So use those uh, uh, after the show. As always, um, your, your comments, we appreciate them both during the show and afterwards. But anyway, I will bring in my guest. So Pete, Van, Pete Blanchard was... Uh, on before, as I said, talking about the Spanish Civil War, he is rivets and pins is one of his Twitter handles. I'm going to bring him in now. So, good evening, Pete. How are you today? Hi, Paul. Fine, thanks. Yourself? I'm very well. So, the whole German tech equipment thing is an endlessly debated subject about, you know, um, over-engineering is a standard thing that comes out, uh, too complicated, bad design. Uh, blah 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 the atlantic wall too many weapons this that and the other so with, with the one of the things we can definitely say is the germans used a lot of vehicles from a lot of different places and they were good at re-equipping them re-categorizing uh, them and finding other uses so it, to illustrate this this kind of principle why did you particularly want to chose choose the panzer 38 as your as your featured vehicle um the reason being that it's quite a simple vehicle in terms of the fact that um, you didn't have lots of um, different versions of it. I mean, there are a few versions which were developed in terms of up armoring, etc. But generally, it was a single tank, a light tank produced in one particular factory rather than various factories. And there's a lot of data written on that. There were a lot of, you know, we know exactly how many were built. We know how many were destroyed, et cetera. So there's a lot of data out there, which obviously facilitates any kind of sort of analysis or look at what the Germans did as, it, as it, when it comes around to reconditioning and reusing old tanks. And basically, I mean, I don't want to sort of spoil what we were talking about later, but, you know, as, as a vehicle, a student of the vehicles and the tech, they hadn't really got any choice anywhere. They 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 had to re repurpose vehicles because they couldn't have continued the war on as many fronts if they hadn't reused vehicles and guns and artillery from other countries. So it's not point. There's no point in debating whether or not it was a good idea because they were kind of their hand was forced. We kind of talked about that this week and the fact that they ha don't have the economy to for a long war. They they they're, they're pushing everything steel production fuel fuel uh, needs all that kind of stuff so they had to do this it's a question of whether or not they did it well i suppose is the question we will ask during the show so um um folks i will tell you that pete has come with a really really good very detailed powerpoint presentation so i'm thinking the questions you have will probably be covered as we go along so i'm kind of think just be a bit patient and assume it's going to come up your question but of course if it, if it doesn't come up or you feel it is not going to come up ask the question and we'll address them as we go along. But basically, I'm going to fire it up now and put it on screen. Hand over to Pete to kind of take us through this. But yes, of course, we do welcome your criticisms and comments and uh, suggestions and, and questions for Pete, and we will do our best to answer them. So over to you, Pete. So all we've got to do is tell me when to move on slides. Okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, the title, Recycling the Panzers, um, it did start off entitled Germany's Tank Obsolescence, but you know, at the risk of glazing everybody's eyes over, I went with recycling the Panzers. This came about the best part of two years ago when I was uh, reading a, a book um, on German tanks, and it stated that a certain tank was used as the basis for a certain other derivative, which kind of clashed with what I'd heard before. So, you know, you start digging into both sides of things. Um, and I ended up down this particular rabbit hole of, okay then, so when a certain tank became obsolete, what were the steps? What actually happened to that vehicle? And that's where we are tonight with this particular talk. Um, so three basic things. What is tank obsolescence? 
what uh, was Germany's particular uh, problem with obsolete tanks and how it dealt with those. Um, and also we'll take a, you know, we'll, we'll also reference that against some of the other large tank using nations such as the Soviet Union and the USA. And then finally, as Paul said, we'll take a look at the Panzer 38 as a case study in what actually happened when it came to a tank reaching the end of its useful frontline life, shall we say. So the first slide um, or the first part of the presentation is literally this one slide. What is obsolescence? Um, as you can see, the top line, the process of becoming obsolete or outdated and no longer used. Um, that's actually a, a dictionary definition rather than a description of my online dating profile. But <laughs> um, token joke. Um, what I've done is to take that dictionary definition and then, as you can see below, uh, I've adapted that to refer to tanks and what we're talking about this evening. So I've said it's the process whereby a tank stops being effective in the role for which it was intended or, or used. Um, we'll stick with that for the moment. There is a big hole in that as a definition, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But that, you know, we'll work with this for the moment. So when a tank stops being effective, it's time to move on and do something else with it. So next slide, please, Paul. So one of the things I, I, I've done is to sit down and think, OK, fine. What exactly were the circumstances for Germany and its obsolete tanks? Um, and I've come up with four main points, the first one being this one. Now, at the start of World War II, Germany was not self-sufficient in certain raw materials. Yes, it had lots of coal and access to coal. Um, but for things like oil and iron ore, which obviously you need to convert into iron and steel to be able to make your tanks and, and guns and ships, it was dependent largely on imports. Um, for example, at about a quarter of Germany's iron ore before World War II kicks off has to come from Sweden because they don't have enough domestically. So comparatively, in other words, compared to, say, the Soviet Union, the USA, British Empire, the amount of natural resources that Germany's got to play with and to plan ahead with is much reduced. Mm -hmm. And obviously, as Germany starts to invade its neighbours, France, Poland, uh, USSR, Yugoslavia, etc., it obviously gains access to any raw materials that are within that country's borders. So things get better for Germany. but of course, if you're back in Germany trying to plan ahead, plan tank production, you don't necessarily or you're not necessarily able to count on, you know, what you may or may not have in six months time. So you really kind of got to base your, your planning assumptions, your production assumptions around what you've got and, you know, the, the resources that you can actually count on. And that, of course, generates a mindset is that so whereby if the army has got so many tanks, then it knows that tank production is not, un, you know, unlimited. It may run into a problem and therefore, you know, you've got to plan on what you can actually get hold of and treat your tanks when they become obsolete, treat them um, as a finite resource and therefore look after them a bit more carefully rather than thinking you can just park them in a field and just get some new ones. Uh, next slide, please, Paul. A uh, bit of a busy slide, this, but um, I'll explain my way through it. Um, in terms of tanks, Germany starts off World War II on the wrong foot, really. Yes, it's got panzer divisions um, and it's got light divisions with tanks. Um, and obviously, as we know from history, the campaign in Poland worked for Germany and they won. Same in France, etc. But in terms of tanks and numbers of tanks, it starts off with an imbalance. It's got too few medium tanks, and your medium tank is effectively your uh, meat and two veg tank. It's your combat tank. This is the thing that breaks through the enemy enemy lines. It's the thing that fights off enemy tanks, etc. It does all the work. Light tanks, on the other hand, are very useful for reconnaissance, scouting, uh, flank protection, etc. But if you look at the graph, 
The two light tanks, the Panzer I and the Panzer II in the blue and the gray, account for over 80% of Germany's tanks on the eve of the invasion of Poland, and less than 20% are medium tanks. In terms of numbers, you're looking at about over 2,000 Panzer I's and Panzer II's. In terms of the, the meat and two veg tank, the Panzer III, um, because the Panzer IV at the time was supposedly a support tank with its stubby little howitzer. The Panzer III, there are only 87. So you kind of get an idea that, okay, things are really round the wrong way. You should have really 80% mediums and arguably 20%, only 20% lights. Germany's got it the wrong way round. And of course, that means that effectively, within a short period of time, a lot of these tanks are effectively going to be obsolete, especially if you're using them as combat vehicles. Just, just one question for you, Pete. Um, is part of this understand they had too few medium tanks based on the knowledge of hindsight in that now we know the Sherman tank, probably the, you know, one of the most produced tanks in World War II, was a medium tank. Panther, I guess, is a medium tank. And so we now know that by 42, 43, 44, the medium tank becomes the king of the battlefield. So is some of this information with the benefit of hindsight or was it already that sort of thinking being talked about the the, the, you know, the the people we talk of as the kind of the fathers of armor the ambassadors of armor the guderians and i suppose Patton were, were they already talking about medium tanks as being the future say 38 39 or is it something as i said that we kind of know with with the benefit of hindsight no um it's something which at the time um was you know germany was planning to have that correct balance if you like the fact right. they only went into uh, the first, uh the, into Poland with 87 Panzer threes. Um, if they'd met all of their production targets, then they would have gone in with far more of those, and they wouldn't have had to use so many of the the, the more obsolete light tanks. Okay, cool. It was only because the Panzer three they, they spent a lot of time umming and ahhing over or trying to get the right kind of suspension for the vehicle, and it took them five different models to get or five versions to get there and then once they decided that they suddenly realized they had a, a production problems actually trying to produce the vehicles because the the transmissions the gearboxes etc were just not available there have been problems in developing the gearboxes so had they met the production targets everything would have been from a balance point of view a lot a lot more favorable um just one last thing on this side while we're, while we're here. Um, talking about the fact that the Panzer I's and Panzer II's are going to end up obsolete very soon. The Panzer I was obsolete as of 1937. Mm. Um, as if anybody uh, remembers back to the uh, talk I did on the Battle of Sesenia, uh, it was realised before the end of 1936, the first year of the Spanish Civil War, that if you're using tanks with only a couple of machine guns as armament, uh, and you're up against uh, an anti-tank gun or a tank with a cannon on it, then effectively you're toast. So it was it was already known by 1937 that you know the Panzer I um, was not going to be a vehicle which was you know useful for any kind of, of combat really. Okay. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Right, Beuter Panzer. And any German speakers amongst you are going to have to really grit your teeth and forgive my um, pronunciation this evening. German, German is not one of my languages. Um, Beuterpanzer. Some of you may be familiar with the term, others maybe not so much, but effectively translates literally as booty tank. Um, these are the vehicles that you get hold of when you defeat an army, you take their equipment, and then you've got a load of tanks. Now, Beuter Panzer, the term actually came into use in the First World War when Germany captured lots of British tanks, repurposed them and put them into their own armoured units. Um, and Beuter Panzer was, if you actually do any reading on this, um, you realise that as Germany was successful in its invasions of its neighbours, uh, it obviously captured a lot of vehicles. And being in the position where you, you've got, you're constrained on supplies of raw materials and therefore production of armaments, you're going to look very seriously at trying to use these 
captured vehicles in some kind of useful format. So in Poland, they captured some uh, Polish 7TP tanks, their version of the, the, the British Vickers uh, six-tonner. Uh, but it wasn't until they came to France that they really came into the, uh, what's the word? Uh, they really started to collect lots and lots, literally hundreds and hundreds of captured French tanks. Uh, so much so that even before France had been defeated, um, back in Germany, they'd established four tank staffs, which would each have responsibility for a sector of France. And what they were aiming to do was to go into that sector of France, scour the countryside, army depots, etc., for French tanks, collect them up into depots, and then ship them off for reconditioning for use with German armor divisions. They'd even gone as far as to specify which French tank factories would do the reconditioning for which models of tanks. So even before the fighting's finished, there's advanced planning going into, you know, we know we haven't got enough Panzer III still, even though this is now May 1940. Let's take some of these French tanks, which we know are quite good. Yeah. Um, the problem with that is that they'd either forgotten something or they weren't aware of something. And that something was the fact that French tanks do not work with German uh, doctrine of the time. What do I mean by that? If we look at the way Germans crewed their tanks, we'll take the Panzer III. Panzer IV works exactly the same. Crew of five members. Each of those crew members has a specific set of responsibilities. So you've got a driver, drives the tank, radio operator. You've got a gunner who aims and fires the gun. A loader who loads the appropriate round of ammunition into the, the the main gun, and you've got a commander who obviously commands the tank, tells the driver back, forward, left, right, and communicates with the platoon commander or company commander. So that's how Germans, the Germans wanted to use their vehicles. So you've got a nice split of responsibilities within the tank. Now, you look at a typical French tank of the time, and you've got a crew of two or three. You've got a driver, maybe a radio operator, and you've got a commander. And that commander sits in the turret on his own. He's got to command the tank, but he also does what the gunner does in the German tank. He's, and he also does what the loader does. So he's got to basically load, aim, fire the gun, keep an eye out on where the enemy is, tell the driver where to drive to, as well as keep communicating to his platoon commander. That's a lot of responsibility, and in a battlefield situation, a very stressful place to be. Now, the Germans took one look at that and thought, that really is not going to work. Um, so the plans they had of populating various battalions with French tanks basically came to a screeching halt when they realized that this wasn't going to work. But hundreds of these tanks they had, so they had to do something with them. Likewise, when the um, invasion of the Soviet Union happened in 1941, Again, the Soviets lost thousands of tanks, mostly obsolete tanks of their own. So in a way, it almost did them a favor, losing 90% of their tank fleet. Um, but again, the Germans managed to take a lot of these into uh, their own ranks. They may not have used them as frontline tanks, but they certainly did reuse a large number of these Russian or Soviet vehicles. And then, if you like, there's the third wave major wave of these captured tanks, the Beuter Panzer, is when Italy surrenders in 1943. German, uh, the German army in Italy quickly moves to uh, neutralize the Italian army and all of the Italian armor, which is available, the M1542, the Semaventi assault guns, there and the, the armored cars, they're all taken into German control. Some are given to the Italian fascist forces, which remain loyal to Germany, but the rest are treated effectively as Beuter Panzer. So as I say there, is, are the Beuter Panzer really booty or are they more of a burden? But we'll look at that later. Uh, next slide, please. And as we've seen, um, the Panzer Ones and Panzer Twos, um, which the Panzer One being obsolete before the war, the Panzer Two as a combat vehicle quickly becomes obsolete as do the two Czech tanks, which the Germans use, the 35 and the 38. Um, and even the Panzer III, 
Um, by the end of 1943, effectively, it's no longer the main frontline tank it once was and starts to get retired and put out to pasture. Uh, next slide, please. So there's a, a brief summary of four of the major points which I think contribute to Germany having its unique predicament. Um, why do I say unique? Well, effectively, what we've got here is Germany in starting off the war in a in not a good place as regards raw materials. It's also not in a good place when it comes to the type of tanks it wants to kit out its divisions with. It's got too many light tanks, far too few medium tanks. So it's already got a surplus of obsolete vehicles. The Beuter Panzer are effectively obsolete. And then the early tank models, which were effective in the early year or two of the war, um, by end of 1941, 43 for the Panzer III, again, they're adding to Germany's obsolete stockpile. Now, the reason it's unique, if you, if you look at some of the other major tank uh, using nations, such as the Soviet Union, as I mentioned, they lose 90% of their tank force in the first few months of Operation Barbarossa, which kind of gives them, it, they no longer have uh, a problem regarding obsolete tanks because they've either been captured or destroyed. Their problem now is one of getting hold of tanks that they can use to try and stop and defeat the Germans. Similarly, the British, 1940, um, June, the end of fighting in France, they managed to ship back to Britain, I think it's nine cruisers and 12 light tanks. They lose nearly 700 tanks in France. Um, so again, they've got a similar problem. They've lost all of their obsolete tanks. They don't have to worry about that so much. It's getting new ones, which is the problem. And even the obsolete tanks, which they've got in the armored unit in Egypt, is equipped with vehicles, which as soon as uh, Italy declares war in 1940, I think it's July, um, the vehicles that Italy is trying to pit against the British are easily overcome by what the British have got uh, there anyway. Um, so the question in blue at the bottom of this slide is, what did Germany do with its obsolete tanks? So if we flick to the next slide, there we go. It's not particular, if you think about it, this isn't rocket science. It's, you know, as I say in the title, it's recycling, repurposing. Um, and you've effectively got here the four stroke five different options available to any, any nation which had obsolete tanks at the time. And if we flick to the first one, talking about upgrading, we can see what Germany did with upgrading its existing tanks. So one of the options it had was to take its existing tanks, which it felt were either obsolete or approaching obsolescence, and do something with them to extend their life. Now, a couple of obvious examples uh, from 1940. Um, after the Battle of France and the fall of France, um, you know, the German tank units are, are obviously writing reports, providing feedback. And it's quickly realized that the Panzer III, the, the medium tank, which is supposed to be the, the central tank for the tank divisions, the Panzer divisions, it's only got a 3.7 centimeter gun. Now, when it was planned, that was it was looking that that was going to be far, you know, that was going to be sufficient for what it was used for. When they got to France, uh, there was a bit of a nasty surprise because what they found was even some of the small French tanks, like the Renault R35 and the, the Hotchkiss H35, these had 40 millimeters of armor, and some of the tank crews were as well as the anti-tank crews who were using that similar size gun, were rather distraught to see their shells bouncing off the front of these tanks. So an upgrade program was quickly put together. And what happened was, I think they ended up with 424 Panzer threes um, were upgraded. What they did was to take off the 37 or the 3.7 centimeter gun, stick on the short 50 or five centimeter gun, Germans tend to use centimeters rather than millimeters for their guns. 
And if you look at the two photographs there, it, at the top, you've got a G version, Panzer three. Bottom, you've got the same vehicle, but it's got the new gun. It's got a mantlet on the front of the turret, that armor, piece of armor going across the front. So you've got extra protection on the front of the turret. Extra armor on the front of the hull from 30 millimeters up to 50 millimeters of armor. And then they obviously had to upgrade the suspension because you're putting a lot more weight on the front of the tank. So new tracks go on to try and spread the weight. They then have to change the torsion bars at the front to put thicker torsion bars in so that the torsion bars don't break with this, this extra weight on there. So you've got this program which kicks off, uh, I think, December 1940, runs through 1941 and 42, upgrading these old or older Panzer threes. They did something similar with the Panzer twos. We're upgrading the armor on those. The armor was a much harder thing to do because you've got a small turret and it's hard to fit a large gun in a small turret. So that was left alone. But again, the Panzer II also had extra armor in an attempt to stop it becoming obsolete too soon. Right, next one, please. Right, here's a map from the end of 1941. Um, it looks fairly accurate, but if anybody spots any inaccuracies in it, inaccuracies in it, then fine. Alternative uses. Now, if you're fighting, say, as was happening at the time in 1941, you're fighting the Soviet Union as a German tank commander, and you're realizing that your tanks are no longer having an effect because you're coming up against things like the T-34. You're shells are just bouncing off the front. Um, you obviously want a tank that's going to work. Uh, the obsolete tanks, you want to get rid of those so they get sent back to Germany, but what do you do with them? Because the hole in the argument that I said at the beginning, that definition of a tank becomes obsolete once it's no longer useful uh, in the purpose for which it was intended or being used. The hole in that definition is that, well, actually, if you take that tank out of the front line fighting the Soviets and you put it into, say, Yugoslavia, mm. where you're fighting a resistance movement which is lightly armed with no armor of its own, certainly not in the, the, the initial years of the, of the uh, occupation, and they've got very limited anti-tank weapons, then even if you've got the, use the technical term, the crappiest tank in your armory down there, it's still going to be of use. So that's what this map is trying to tell us. That a lot of the French Beuter Panzers were still used as tanks. They were used in the Netherlands, in France, in the Channel Islands, and a lot were sent down to Yugoslavia. Um, you also had, when the Panzer threes were um, eventually uh, moved out of the front line. At the end of the war, you had uh, a Panzer Brigade staffed with Panzer, or full of Panzer III's up in Norway, North Italy, also Yugoslavia as well. Um, and also to mention, uh, Denmark is on there. And also in the east, Belarus, Poland, Ukraine, you've got resistance movements there. You've got the partisans. So again, if you you know, you may not need the latest Panther or Tiger or Panzer IV, but if you ship out their tanks against which the people you're fighting have got no answer to, then those tanks are still going to be valid. So just uh, to jump in with a question, Pete, um, yeah. with the play to the upgrade and alternative use and conversions, is that how much of these decisions are being made on an economics and time factor as well? Because it's that old thing when you've got a 20 year old car and you take it to the garage and they say, it's going to cost you X amount to get this back up and running, or we can sell you a new one for Y. And you have to make that decision of where you put your time and where you put your money. Because, you know, when you said there about tanks being uh, useful and not a benefit, I immediately thought of the Allies and Australians, for example, using Stuart tanks in 1945 out in the Pacific. But the Allies in the 1945 can transport whatever they want, wherever the hell they want to, because they've got this huge, great tail behind them. So it's easy for the Allies to just shift tanks from one theater to another. But the Germans, even by 40, 40 41, they're, they're, they're already losing their logistical control. So I can understand the tank, the, the tank people saying, we can use this vehicle elsewhere, but how are the the people who have the budget strings and the people who have who are who are juggling the resources? Are they getting involved in this decision making process? I would say yes, but to which extent 
really depends on on the type of alternative use or or the solution it's probably the best thing to talk about here the solution that you're talking about if you're talking about shipping obsolete tanks to um a secondary theater of war say yugoslavia for example uh, an occupied country you don't have to spend much the only money you're spending is literally on the coal going into the train yeah. it's going to take it down there if you're upgrading going back to that panzer 3 pro upgrade program you've then got to select a facility which is going to do it can the factory do it has it got the capacity to do it or is it working all out on producing brand new tanks can it be done at a depot if it can great okay now can we get the guns we want for the upgrade can we get the extra armor plates for the upgrade so yeah there are decisions to be taken here um as we'll see later when it comes well, well I'll, I'll address conversions when we get there because it's kind of kind of covered in that as well um but yeah you're right to a certain extent that sort of decision making does have to happen for some of these solutions okay right and with that we'll probably flick to this slide another alternative use which was very popular with tank using nations is well if you've got a tank which is no longer useful as a main combat tank or a tank for, for use actually in in action why not use it for training the british did that admirably with the covenanter tank uh, if any of you have heard of that or seen one, it's very similar looking to the Crusader. They were developed alongside each other, but the cruise, uh, while the Crusader was taken into uh, into service in North Africa, the Covenanter never actually made it that far. It had some fundamental overheating problems at the start of its uh, uh, life. These were eventually resolved, but by the time they were resolved, the tank was obsolete anyway. But hundreds and hundreds of these have been built in anticipation of the overheating problem being resolved. At the end, the British just used them for training tanks. And it make, that makes sense, because why would you take tanks that you can use on the front line or tanks that you have to use on the front line now and need to get out there? Why would you divert those to train your crew when you can take old, obsolete tanks, which maybe don't have a turret or whatever? Um, you can use those instead. And the Germans did exactly that. There's an example of a Panzer II on the screen. What they've done is take off the superstructure and the turret, stick a, a, a bit of a frame at the front to give the, the, the driver some kind of feeling of being or looking out from inside a tank. And the Germans used literally hundreds of these vehicles to train drivers uh, as well as other tank crew. So again, another type of alternative use. Right, next slide, please. Conversions. Now, this is the one that usually gets the, the model makers uh, salivating. Um, converting tanks into other more useful, more interesting looking vehicles. And again, a lot of tank building nations did this, or even tank using nations did this. Um, the example we've got on screen, again, is a Panzer II. And as the Panzer II becomes less and less viable as a, uh, a combat tank, it's used as the basis for several other vehicles. The one we've got on screen is a tank destroyer. It's, it's the Marder II, uh, armed with a 7.5 centimeter anti-tank gun. So this is the sort of vehicle that can tackle um, a T-34, whereas the original tank can't. 25% of the Marder IIs were actually converted from old obsolete Panzer II tanks. The rest were built upon fresh chassis. Uh, it's a bit of a tongue twister, fresh chassis. Um, coming out of the factory, instead of putting a superstructure and a turret on, they put the gun on and the, the casemate around the armor around it. So those did happen. But kind of alluding back to what you were saying, Paul, about resources, um, decision making, cost, etc., converting tanks. Um, I think, and people may may decide I'm wrong here, but I think there there are some myths uh, have been generated over the years about German tanks being converted into various tank destroyers or assault guns or recovery vehicles or 
or what have you. Some of that did go on, but I think a lot less than people actually think. Um, if we flick to the next slide, I'll explain why. Building a tank. Now, building a tank back in the 1940s went along roughly the similar sort of lines as building a car does today. You would have an assembly plant. That assembly plant wouldn't necessarily, certainly for Germany, wouldn't necessarily um, make the parts to build the tank. They literally put the bits together. So they would get in the armor plate from the supplier. They would get in uh, tracks from a supplier. They would get in the engine, the gearbox, the rest of the transmission, the radios, uh, the guns, all from different suppliers. They would go in, typically go into a factory. They would build the hull, add on the suspension, the wheels, the tracks, put the engine in, the gearbox, the seats, everything else. Then you've got your basic chassis, which is kind of what I'm showing here in the, in the, uh, on the left-hand side of the picture. And then they would put in the, or put on the superstructure, the turret, put the radio in, the aerial, the bits and pieces, the armament, etc., to come up with your finished tank. When you're building a tank destroyer, for example, on that same chassis in the factory, again, you build the basic vehicle, the basic chassis, the hull, um, but you obviously don't put on the tank superstructure or the tank turret. You then put on the appropriate superstructure or the casemate for that tank destroyer. You put in, then put in the radio, the big powerful gun on the front, and there you've got your tank destroyer. So effectively, if you like, your production line starts off as building your chassis, and then it diverges into building tanks and building the other vehicles. Now, when it comes to actually converting tanks which have been used out in the field, you add in an extra complication, which we see on the next slide, please. So at the top, you've got this building the tank to shore, which I've just described. But if you're converting a tank which has been used out in the field, to say a tank destroyer, you've got an extra process in place. That process is you've got to get the tank to the tank factory. You've then got to inspect it to see what still works on it, what needs repairing, what needs replacing. Is the engine worn out? Because we're not talking about a 2022 Ford Focus with three years warranty and an engine which is going to go on for years and years and years. We're talking about an engine which has probably got a few thousand kilometers in it at most. Likewise with the gearbox, these things are going to be, the, the gears in the gearbox are going to be crunched around by the driver over all sorts of countryside. It's going to take a lot of punishment. So you may have to replace the gearbox. The tracks are probably worn out, need replacing. The rubber tires on the road wheels, the rubber's probably not in a very good situation. So some of those might have to be replaced and so on. So you've got to invest time, effort, obviously cost in terms of spare parts and manpower in this extra process of reconditioning the tanks coming back into the factory before you end up with a chassis upon which you can then put your tank destroyer bits and pieces. And expertise, I'm guessing as well, Pete, in that someone's got to analyze a, a, a basic low level factory worker can churn out, for, for example, rubber wheels without having much information about how to use tanks in combat. But assessing the damage to a gearbox, assess, assess you need someone with a little, a little bit more knowledge of what, what the battle does. So you're, you're, you're adding that to the equation as well. Absolutely. Now, interestingly enough, at the start of the war, it was envisaged that this would not so much conversions take place, but the role of the tank maintenance personnel in the field would be one of repairing any light damage, replacing engines, anything that could be done in the field with rudimentary the rudimentary equipment they had. They could do that there and then. If it couldn't be done by them, they would send the tank back to a central depot. And then most probably, if it's badly damaged enough, it would then go back to the factory. So the factories were kind of geared up to do this. And this apparently worked reasonably well up till the end of 1941, when it basically fell apart. The tank factories were had been instructed, basically, priority number one, build new tanks. If you've then got capacity to build the spare parts for tanks, then great. Uh, but of course, that results in a spare parts shortage in the field. And of course, it then also constricts the ability within the factories to actually take in these vehicles, inspect them, recondition them, and then 
get them ready for building into something else. So while conversions of existing tanks sounds like a wise uh, use of your resources, it's not really very efficient. Um, and as Germany found out, it wasn't as easy as they'd planned at the beginning. Right. But here are some examples of conversions they actually did. The top two at the left are the Panzer Jaeger one and the, the SIG 33, that big 15 centimeter infantry gun, which takes out houses with a couple of shells. Um, they were actually built on converted Panzer ones. The rationale or the reason being there is that at the time, Germany was obviously trying to churn out as many vehicles as possible. It didn't have that many available chassis to start building these um, interim designs, if you like. I mean, that, that is a very basic Panzer Jaeger one. 4.7 millimeter uh, centimeter check gun on a on a Panzer one chassis. Uh, that Panzer one chassis with the 15 centimeter gun on, that gun has still got the wheels on it. Um, it's literally just, and, and the gun trail, it's literally plonked on there and secured in there um, inside that casemate. And it was a case of that's all they had at the time. They couldn't spare the chassis. Likewise, with the Flamingo, there was a, a requirement for a small flamethrower tank. What did they do? They took the failed Panzer II version D, which was supposed to be the fast version of the Panzer II, uh, which was actually fast um, until, unfortunately, they tried to take it off road and realized it was actually a, a quite, a, it was slower than the usual Panzer II. So, they combined the need for a flamethrower tank with these vehicles. Uh, unfortunately, the Flamingo wasn't too much of a success. It's a small tank. It can't actually carry that much flame propellant. So it's got to get close to its target. It can't carry enough armor to protect it from the target, which is firing at it. So they were quickly, within a few months, retired from the Eastern Front. And then they were themselves converted into the Marder II, which you see to the right. Um, so there were there was this spate of early war 1940-1941 type conversions, but wherever possible, fresh chassis were used instead. Um, on the bottom, likewise, you had a glut in 1943-1944 or, or surplus of Panzer threes which were being withdrawn from frontline service and replaced by Panzer fours and Panthers. There was a requirement for a recovery vehicle. They were looking to do it on the, the Panther. And as some of you may know, they ended up with a recovery version of the Panther. But before that arrived, they converted a lot of Panzer threes into these Berger Panzer threes uh, to recover stranded tanks. The one in the middle, and boy, am I going to massacre this pronunciation, the Panzer Bachtungswagen three. Um, that was effectively a Panzer III. They took the main gun out. They put a machine gun in, in, the, in, in the hole where the gun went. Uh, a new man that goes on there, and they put a dummy gun on there. Um, looks a bit like some kind of flagpole holder or something, but it kind of worked. It did the trick. They built uh, a few hundred of these. And the purpose of these was to give artillery observers uh, an armoured vehicle, which they could actually drive up pretty close to the front remain protected and call in artillery from the, the uh, Panzer Division Artillery uh, Battalion. And then lastly, you've got the Sturmtiger at the end, the 38 centimeter rocket launcher on the, uh, on the a heavily armored Tiger One, as was then obsolete Tiger One chassis. So they did build them, but the preference was to use fresh chassis where was allowed or where they had the capacity to do so. Now, lastly, we can't talk about conversions without mentioning uh, Major Becker. Really need a show of his own. Um, I'm not going to, certainly not going to attempt it tonight, but we need to mention this man. Uh, an engineer by trade, he served in the First World War and then by the time of the Second World War, he's an artillery officer. But he ends up crewing uh, an organization which takes a lot of the French boy to Panzer, a lot of the slower French tanks, the FCM 36, the, the Hotchkiss H39, uh, the Lorraine Schlepper uh, tractor, etc., adds on 
anti-tank guns or artillery pieces and effectively produces hundreds of very useful vehicles for the German army. And, and they see action not only in France with the 21st Panzer Division in Normandy, they see action on the Eastern Front, North Africa, etc. So, um, again, if you're interested in this sort of thing and you don't know about this guy, he's worth at least a look. Yeah, it's worth at least a look at his wiki page. Next one, please. And lastly, probably the worst thing you can do is either stick your obsolete tanks in storage because you can't think of another thing to do with them. Um, not the most efficient use of a valuable resource, but or salvage them, scrap the vehicles, take out the guns, the battery, the engine, the gearbox, and try and reuse them elsewhere. Uh, again, not a particularly efficient use of these raw materials, which have already gone through a manufacturing process. And we had the question earlier, Peter, about whether or not the Russian vehicles that were knocked out in Barbarossa were scrapped or salvaged. I mean, we know some were obviously salvaged for use, but scrapping, I mean, it's, it is very hard to take a tank and break it down to raw materials again. It takes as much time to break it down as it does to, to actually just get the materials again. As your, your point about easier to use an existing chassis than it is convert one. So I guess the answer is no, they didn't do much scrapping of Russian vehicles. Exactly. Um, what, what you do find um, are pictures, you know, Russian tanks were reused, but not necessarily as tanks. Mm -hmm. So you see them used as gun tractors. You see them used as... Uh, you know, ammunition carriers and the like. Uh, so, what, you know, while they were still running, why not use them? When they stop running, if you haven't got any others that you can nick bits off of and cannibalize to actually keep your one running, then you just leave it. Right. Right. And I think that gets us to, yeah, to 38. Yeah. Yes, indeed. So, the, what I've called the case study on the Panzer 38. So, um, what I'm going to be talking about is obviously the Panzer 38, what it was, where it came from, what it was used for. So you get an idea of what we're looking at with this particular uh, little tank. We'll also look at why it's important. And then we'll look at what the Germans did with it as it gradually became obvious that this could no longer survive as a combat vehicle on the, uh, on the front line. So if we move to the next slide. So... The middle of the 1930s, the Czech, or the Czechoslovakian, as, as was, the Czechoslovakian army wanted a light tank. They ended up with this tank on the left, the LT VZ-35. Um, that, again, look, looks like some kind of garbled code, but it's actually, there's actually logic to it. It stands for Lechki tank, Lechki meaning light, so light tank, Vzor, version 35 from 1935. So it's the light tank version 35. This was built by Škoda. The design was again copied from the British six tonner from which I think was designed originally in about 1928, 29. So it's, it's a kind of an, it's not exactly a state of the art design, but it, it's one that works. It's a simple enough one that works. But Škoda go one better. They come up with a bit more of a complicated suspension, which seems to work and steering mechanism also. The problem is, is that it's not a tried and tested uh, mechanism and the suspension starts to come up with all sorts of problems. The army within a year or two decide they'd rather have a tank that works than one that doesn't. So again, they go out to tender and say, OK, you know, we want a tank to replace this. Škoda come up with a redesign of the LT-35. But another uh, firm, Czechardé, um, or CKD in English um, is the approximate translation of that, um, come up with a tank based upon um, a vehicle they've been selling to other countries already, the TNH. And the TNH has already been sold to Switzerland, been sold to Persia and Peru. For this particular um, contract or tender, they come up with a version called the TNH-S sometimes referred to as the TNHP, you'll see that also. Um, it's the same vehicle. Slightly different design turret. It's got a, a more improved gun than the 35 had. It's the latest A7 gun, I think, from Škoda. Uh, so you get a put it into this tank and the army take 
examples of both tanks and put them through various road trials for several thousand kilometers. They soon realized that the TNH tank is far superior and they give the contract for 150 vehicles to CKD. Which is good news for CKD, uh, good news for the army, except that in the interim, before the tanks actually come off the production line, the Germans invade what's left of Czechoslovakia in March 1939. The Czech army or the Czechoslovakian army never gets to see, never gets its hands on these tanks. And the story goes that when the Germans march into uh, Prague, uh, a group of tank officers go to the CKD factory, knock on the door. The caretaker doesn't speak German, lets them in, realizes who they are, shows them around the place and shows them the, the plans for the TNHS. Uh, the Germans look at this and think, oh, this looks rather special. Um, and they quickly realize that this is going to be a very useful tank for the German army. Now, um, we'll explain why in the next couple of slides. So if we go to this first one. German tank lineup in 1938. I've referred to these already. So you've got the in this sort of top Trump's type spreadsheet, you've got the Panzer I and the Panzer II, the two light tanks. We can see what they're armed with machine guns. A two centimeter auto cannon is a kind of heavy machine gun. Um, maximum armor of only up to 15 uh, millimeters at the front, under 10 tons in weight, uh, and they can go at 40 kilometers an hour, 25 miles an hour, and a range of up to 200 kilometers before they need refilling with fuel. The Panzer III, the com main combat tank, has got the standard German 3.7 centimeter gun. It's got some additional machine guns as backup, uh, twice the amount of armor. And you won't be surprised to, obviously, that kind of correlates to twice the weight of the tank. You've got the bigger engine, the bigger gun, more armor equals more weight. Uh, top speed also 40 kilometers an hour and a range of 165. So that's supposed to be the main combat tank. And then you've got the support tank. Uh, with the 7.5 centimeter howitzer, which is supposed to blow up the any awkward machine gun nests or uh, gun emplacements that the the Panzer threes can't deal with. Again, similar amount of armor, similar weight, etc. Now, as we've seen earlier, the Germans have got lots of the Panzer ones and lots of the Panzer twos. In the Polish campaign, they've got 87, only 87 Panzer threes and 198 Panzer fours. So if we go to the next slide, we can see how the Czech tank fits in nicely. And this is why the Germans got rather excited. Because it's got almost the same gun. I say almost, it's the same caliber, more or less, um, as the Panzer III. It's got a couple of machine guns. Importantly, it's almost got the same amount of frontal armor on there. So if you, if you look at this, you think this is the Germans thought we can kind of use this as a Panzer III. And in fact, for the first few months, it was referred to as the Czech Panzer III before it was given various names and ended up as the Panzer 38. Because it's a very compact tank, it's not a large tank, it's a small tank, and it's a compact small tank, they kept the weight at under 10 tons. So even with a decent amount of armor at the front, the 3.7 centimeter gun, etc., they kept the weight under 10 tons and managed to get the fuel tanks to such a size that they actually gave the tank 250 kilometers of range before you needed to top it up with fuel. So you can kind of understand by comparing the 38 with the Panzer III, why the Germans suddenly realized they're onto a very good thing here. Next slide, please. So 1939, by the time or by the end of August, um, CKD, which has now had its name changed to BMM, uh, probably because the Germans couldn't pronounce Czechardé. Um, BMM produces 98 of the 150 contracted vehicles. Germany puts, or the, the, the armed forces put 41 into reserve and they allocate 57 to Panzer Battalion 67, uh, part of the 3rd Light Division, which later becomes the 8th Panzer Division. And it's own, this tank is only given to that particular unit. Now, you may think, well, why is that? Why would they do that? Why not give the tank more exposure, more exp <clears throat> or give more tank crews experience with the new tank? 
Well, if you think about it, as I mentioned, it's kind of the same caliber as the Panzer III, but you couldn't use the same ammunition in both. You would need mechanics who understood how this new tank worked using non-German parts. You would need um, uh, spare parts. So by concentrating those into one unit, you minimize the amount of logistics that you're gonna need to actually support this vehicle. And that's what they did, makes sense. The other interesting point to know is that word in brackets, verlastet, which is German for loaded. Um, because the Germans tried an experiment with this tank. Um, Panzer, Abtei, Long 67, and I think one other, uh, I think it was armed with Panzer twos. They were labeled as Verlastet because their tanks were mounted on the back of trucks, as you can see in the photographs. The idea being that these tanks would not rumble across the Polish border on their tracks. They would rumble across on the back of lorries. So they could be taken more quickly to a place where their presence was needed, where they needed to fight. They would be unloaded. They would go into action. And after the action, those that obviously survived would then go back on the trucks and they could then be carted off to another sector where they required more quickly than if they were just merely uh, crawling along their tracks. There doesn't seem to be too much, certainly that I found, um, on how successful this was. But bearing in mind it was never ever tried again by the German army, I think we can probably assume that it wasn't too much of a success. But the feedback from the troops of Battalion 60, Panzer Battalion 67 was very positive, as we'll see in the next slide, please. They said it was mechanically reliable, it was robust, and it didn't need much maintenance. It took them 30 minutes a day just to maintain the vehicle, uh, which is substantially uh, less than its German equivalents. I can't remember what the numbers were. Um, I won't read the quote in blue, but it's worth your while reading it while I'm blabbing away here, um, because it does demonstrate the robustness of this new tank, which clearly took the Germans by surprise. Uh, the quote is from a colonel who sent a load of tank crews down to Prague to bring back their brand new Panzer 38s from the factory. And if you read that, it gives you a flavor of what the Germans thought of this little vehicle. And it's also clearly explains why this vehicle was kept in production for as long as it was, either as a tank or, or, or whatever. And I think that mechanically reliable is is a key phrase there because I, I know that's a little bit of a trope that everyone says that the, you know the tiger and the panther and stuff were were, were re unreliable and there's elements of truth and also myth towards that. But yeah, if if something is coming off the battlefield and it's reliable, that that's good all round, isn't it? That's that's definitely everyone's going to notice that. Exactly, and it, it's not as if yeah, you know, I don't want people to think that. <clears throat> excuse me, I don't want people to think that. By implication, the rest of the German tanks were rubbish. They clearly weren't, but they, they were suffering from the same kind of teething troubles. Because bearing in mind, you know, this is oh, this is less than 25 years after the invention of the tank. A lot of the technology is still very fresh, still very new, still very untried. So British tanks were breaking down, German tanks were breaking down, Russian tanks were breaking, or Soviet tanks were breaking down, etc. You know, this wasn't something that was peculiar to the Germans, um, but it was just the fact that the, the Panzer 38, when it came along, I mean, it wasn't a revolutionary tank by any means. It was built using old technology. It was built with riveted armor, whereas the, the Germans and the Soviets were now moving on to um, welded armor, which provided, you know, uh, a, you could produce lighter tanks using welded armor than you could with riveted armor because you didn't have a frame inside the tank to actually rivet the uh, armor plate to. It was built with leaf spring suspension rather than the um, current favorite, which was suspension bar, uh, torsion bar suspension. Um, so it, it wasn't some kind of miraculous super tank, mini tank. Um, it was just very good at what it did. Right, let's look at this uh, next slide. So here we are, USSR 1941. The Panzer 38, as we've seen, worked very well in Poland. It worked very well in, in France in 1940. 
Um, the third light division became the eighth Panzer division, and it continued to use the Panzer 38, as did the seventh Panzer division. So General Rommel also had a taste of, of how good this little tank was. The eighth Panzer division also uses it in, in the march into Yugoslavia in early 41. But of course, with Barbarossa, things start to change. This is no longer a campaign of a few weeks, like we saw in Poland, in the Low Countries with France, Yugoslavia, Greece. This is a campaign which lasts beyond weeks, beyond months, and as we know now, lasted years uh, on the Eastern Front. You've got a longer campaign. It's no longer a question of a few weeks, and then we can take all the tanks back to Germany and then maintain them all. They're out in the field for months at a time. You've got harsher conditions than they've been used to in prior campaigns. You've got, obviously, you know, the, the summer gives way to the, 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 the mud in Russia in the autumn and then into the Russian winter and, and the, low, uh, uh, the snow, the ice and the low temperatures. All of these take a toll on Germany's tanks. Uh, the army, army, the enemy becomes better armed. Uh, you've got bigger guns firing bigger shells uh, increasingly at German tanks. Uh, 76 millimeter field guns are firing. Um, you're seeing increasing numbers of uh, T-34s, KV-1s, against which the Panzer 38 is effectively useless. And even things like anti-tank mines, which it hasn't really faced to any great extent in, in earlier campaigns. You're seeing these used as the, the war in Russia, because in the war in Russia becomes more and more positional rather than the, the mobile uh, campaigns of, of the summer. And an anti-tank mine, if a, if a Panzer IV rolls over an anti-tank mine, yeah, it's going to go bang, the track is going to snap, you, you may even blow off or damage a suspension unit. But you tow it out of the minefield, you can repair it and off you go. A light tank like the Panzer 38 weighs half as much. It can't absorb as much blast, so when the mine goes bang, the track comes flying off. You're also going to find that the suspension is actually damaged. Even though those big road wheels are made out of six millimeter armor plate, they still get bent um, or they break. The hull typically uh, tended to fracture as well. And of course, you've got two crew members at the front of the tank. So your, your driver and your radio operator are going to get injured. So they, clearly, by the end of 1941, this is not the Panzer 38 is not a tank to be riding around with, with the enemy in sight. Next one, please. So at the beginning of 1942, it's realized that the Panzer 38 really isn't feasible anymore as, or viable anymore as a, a frontline vehicle, as a, as a combat vehicle, which is what it's being used as to supplement the Panzer threes. They can't upgun it. Um, the turret is too small and they can't put a bigger turret on there because they can't extend the turret ring, which is already at the width of the tank. So you can't put any more a, a bigger gun in there. It's already been up armoured to 50 millimetres in front, so the armour has been doubled, but it's still susceptible to all of the things I've just mentioned. So they start to replace them with Panzer 3s and Panzer 4s, and the surviving Panzer 38s are sent back to the West, back to the factories to hopefully be reconditioned and turned into something useful. Which brings us to Homer, wondering what happened to the remaining Panzer 38s? Um, and this is the bit which I got interested in, as I mentioned a couple of years ago, I, I, I looked at the Panzer 38 for the reasons I, I discussed earlier, the fact that it was built in a single factory in Prague, we know exactly how many were built, we know how many were destroyed, etc. There's a lot of data on this. Um, it's not complete data by any means, but it certainly gives us a very good flavour of what the Germans did in terms of their obsolete vehicles. So if we flick to the next one, we've got the start of a little um, slide which tells us that they built 1,396 of these vehicles. We know that um, because we've got records of the chassis numbers. Um, if you're not quite, for those of you who are not quite sure what a chassis number is, if you've got a car, you've got a chassis number uh, printed on your car on the well, riveted to your car body at some, in some point in there, possibly twice. And what the chassis number is, commonly known these days as a vehicle identification number or VIN, 
that tells a person looking at it, looking at it, um, if they've got the either the knowledge or they've got a, a, some kind of um, booklet or web page which tells them, it will tell you which country your car was built in or then, when it was built, what model it is, who made it, etc. So there's a you know it's a 17 digit these days a 17 digit or 17 character um, code which gives you all this information. And back then the Germans were using certainly the Germans probably other manufacturer uh, other manufacturing countries as well they were giving chassis numbers to their tanks so they could when they got a tank back for repair they could look at the chassis number oh right okay we know what went on this tank originally what needs to go back on it um so it's a very good reference number or unique identifier as they call it for vehicles and we know from the chassis numbers 1396 were built some sources quote higher numbers but they tend to confuse some of the vehicles which were sold separately um, on a separate contract directly to the Slovaks. So 3096 is, if you like, the number of vehicles that were built and delivered to the German, arm, uh, German army. I've said approximately seven, sorry, Paul, we just <laughs> nip back. Um, thanks. The seven, approximately 700, I'm saying were destroyed. Using these two books as sources, um, the Panzer Tracks volumes for the Panzer 38 and for Panzer Production. Again, a lot of the detail which um, Thomas Jentz and Hilary Doyle got is based around um, chassis numbers. So they're actually counting the vehicles um, for each version, for each vehicle, for each model, whatever. So I'm very trustworthy, or I, I'm very trusting of these. Uh, this information i worked for ford motor company for 32 years and if you're talking about chassis numbers that that is one of the sort of lowest denominators of you know but if you're looking at chassis numbers you're looking at some very fundamentally sound data and that's what i'm taking you know i'm taking the, the numbers from these books because it's backed up by chassis numbers if i look in that book they quote by unit by panzer division 795 total uh total losses of panzer 38s by the i think it's february 1943. now we know that some of those did in fact make it back to the factory for repair um there's a soviet intelligence report from a spy in the bmm factory in prague which says by i think it's september 1941 around about 100 vehicles were actually re repaired brought back from from the front and repaired in the factory so i'm taking the Panzer Trax 795 down to call it about 700, which conveniently works out of roughly 50% of the total number of tanks built. So half of the tanks that were built were destroyed, either by Soviet action or by the Germans having to blow up their own tanks as they retreated because they couldn't recover them in time. Um, okay, now can we please go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, we also know that 237 were sold to Germany's Eastern Front allies. Um, Hungary was a tank producing nation of its own. It produced its own tanks, the, the Toldi and the Tudan. Uh, but it couldn't produce enough for what it needed. So it had to buy tanks from the Germans and it ended up buying Tigers, Panzer 3s, all sorts of uh, vehicles, Panzer 4s. It also bought 108 Panzer 38s. Romania took 50 clapped out Panzer 38s when uh, left in the Crimea. Uh, the Germans quickly sold, uh, sold them a, a pup. Uh, the Bulgarians took 10 and the rest went to the Slovak Free State, sold directly from the army, German army, rather than the factory to the Slovaks. So 237 of the remaining 700 were sold. On the next slide, please. Before we look at the number of conversions, I thought we'd go through a little bit of audience participation, perhaps. Um, what I've got here, I've got seven vehicles which are related to the Panzer 38. They were, they were built on the, the, the Panzer 38 structure. I'm just wondering, and people can either put it in chat or they, they don't have to. They can just sort of think, think of a number kind of thing. The question I've got here is, which of these vehicles was actually bait or converted from Panzer or obsolete 
used Panzer 38 tanks. And while people are umming and ahhing and thinking, I'll just quickly explain what they are. Uh, the Marder 3s were early tank destroyers. They're open topped, lightly armored, but they had big guns on them that could actually defeat the Soviet T-34 tanks. The Griller was similar, open top, thinly armored, but it had the big that big 15 centimeter gun on it, the sort of thing that you could uh, use to take out a house. The again, going to butcher this one. Elf Clearung's Panzer 38 was uh, a reconnaissance vehicle armed with a two centimeter auto cannon. Uh, the same weapon which was also used on the Flak Panzer 38, the anti-aircraft tank. Um, and finally, probably the most well-known one of the lot here, the Hetzer, which was a fully enclosed armoured tank destroyer built in 1944 and 45. Now I can see Mr. Mead. And we're getting, we're getting, we're getting some nice uh, Marder-type suggestions here, Marder 3s. Uh, if we go to the next slide, you'll get yeah, the answer. Only one of those models was actually built on recovered or reconditioned Panzer 38 tanks. 175 were taken into the factory, reconditioned, and then turned into these Marder 3 H versions that you see in the photograph here. All of the rest were built on fresh, here we go, fresh chassis um which may come as a surprise to people because a lot of literature still states that the rest of these models were built on the panzer 38 i i was reading that just today pete about hetzers saying a lot of them were built on converted panzer 38 chassis so i i read i forget what i read it in now it might have just been online but i read that a few about four hours ago right and it's amazing how much is in there but Again, if we go by what the Panzer Tracks data tells us, and they've literally got chassis numbers for all of these models, and none of them coincide with the chassis numbers of existing Panzer 38s, then, you know, these were built on fresh chassis. There, I said it. Hey. Now, interestingly enough, the Hetzer was not even built on the Panzer 38 chassis, which may come as a surprise to others. Um, going off at a quick Hetzer type uh, tangent here. Um, 1943, the Germans were after a fast tracked reconnaissance vehicle for the Eastern Front. Um, they obviously had armored cars and things, but they wanted a fast tracked version for the bad going in, in, the, in the spring and the autumn, in the winter. Um, <clears throat> they put out a tender. Skoda came back with a suggestion of, of a T-15 tank, light tank, which could go rather fast, 33.7 centimetre gun. The, I can't remember which tank company in Germany. Uh, Al no, it wasn't Alcat. What was it? Don't know. But they come up with the, the VK-1303 prototype. And then there was a further one which BMM came up with, which was a new version of the Panzer 38, which was called the Panzer 38. Uh, what was it? The, the Neuart. The new version. As it happens, um, the German entry one, and that ended up being the Lux, the little Lux um, light tank, which was used in the Eastern Front and in Normandy. The T 15 kind of disappeared without trace, but the Neue Art Panzer 38 was used as the basis for the Hetzer. And the reason it's kind of not the same as the old Panzer 38. Because it's supposed to be a faster vehicle, it needed obviously it needed a slightly bigger engine. Uh, the gearing was different, and because the, the gearing was different, they enlarged the road wheels by 10 centimeters in diameter. So when you look at a Hetzer and a Panzer 38, the Hetzer wheels are actually larger. So it's not actually built on a Panzer 38 chassis. Um, so there you go. There's, there's a bit of Hetzer trivia for you. Uh, <clears throat> next slide, please. So that then gives us the final jigsaw puzzles to say okay this is what happened to the panzer 38. more or less 700 destroyed 237 sold to allied countries 175 conversions which leaves around about 284 they did something else with 
And that's what I wanted to know. What was that something else? Now, this is where the data starts to get a bit sketchy because a lot of the uses they came into afterwards were not that thoroughly documented. Certainly not as far as I've managed to find so far. Uh, hopefully there's some documentation out there somewhere, but as you will see, a lot of these vehicles wouldn't have been documented anyway. Um, if we can flick to the next slide, we can start looking at some of these other uses. Now, when it came to returning the Panzer 38s, not all of the Panzer regiments followed the order. They kept hold of them. By the time of the Battle of Kursk in July 43, 13 of these vehicles or these tanks were still on the books of three Panzer divisions as tanks, not as converting into anything else. Um, many others were converted. The bottom left hand photograph is a picture of a Panzer 38 used by the 12th Panzer Division in January 1945. It's just been knocked out and the Soviets are marching past it. So these vehicles soldiered on into the last a few months of the war. Other Panzer regiments realizing the value of having this robust little chassis, which didn't go as wrong as many times as, as some of the other vehicles, they kept hold of them, but they took the turrets off, they filled them with ammunition, and bingo, you think, you know, stick a tarpaulin over the top. Some of them even had a car windscreen at the front of the tarpaulin so they, they, they could actually look out. Um, but you've got yourself a, a rather small, nimble, armoured ammunition carrier for your vehicle, or for your tanks. At least three others were turned into mobile cranes for the field workshops, and there's one there on the right at the bottom. So a lot of these were retained in the field, uh, but they just weren't announced as tanks. If we go to the next slide, this is interesting. Uh, <clears throat> I noticed we've got Phil Blood online, so this one will probably um, make him even more interested uh, in the talk than he may have been already. Um, trains, armoured trains. The Germans had some armoured trains at the beginning of the war. I think they also captured some Czech ones, Polish ones, and certainly Soviet ones when they invaded the Soviet Union. And they operated those through to 1942, when they decided to standardise what an armoured train was. And they called this the BP-42 model. So it had a, typically had a locomotive. It would have a certain number of flat guns, a certain number of armoured vehicle, uh, armoured wagons with artillery pieces, uh, a certain amount of infantry. And it would have had a flat car. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> it would have had a flat car at either end of the train with a Panzer 38 on it. And the Panzer 38 was chosen because a they now had enough of these to be able to spare for the uh, armoured trains. But because of its reliability, it's the sort of thing you could send off into partisan-held country and it wouldn't necessarily break down on the way back. Um, so you could send it off and you're pretty confident you're going to see it again at the end of the day. Now, they converted, um, they converted these tanks. Um, they took out the whole machine gun and they put in a radio uh, transmitter. Um, the normal Panzer 38 only had a, tran uh, a, a receiver. Um, clearly, the idea here being that the uh, communication between the tank and the train was more important than having that extra machine gun. So that kind of makes sense. For the technical minded, they replaced the, um, what was it? They they put in the FU5 version of the German radio with the, the transmitter instead of the delightfully named FU2 radio, which was just a receiver. Um, and as it says there, the purpose was to support the train's infantry unit. So when a train, if a train was attacked, the infantry could dismount. They could dismount also one or perhaps both of the tanks to fight off any attacking partisans. And likewise, when an armored train was sent into action to attack a suspected partisan uh, base in a village they could then dismount both the tanks go in with the infantry and annihilate the village and all the villagers um, there were up to i think 27 of these bp42 type trains uh, also BT, bp44 was the later version but they still had the panzer 38 so you're looking at about 50 tanks being used as 
uh, equipment on these armored trains. Next one, please. Thank you. As we saw earlier, training tanks. It's an ideal use for obsolete tanks. Tanks which are no longer going to survive on the battlefield, you may as well use them for something useful. And what could be more useful than training the crews that you're getting into replacing the crews that are being killed, captured or, or wounded? And that's what they did. The Panzer 38, again, very attractive to tra tank training organisations like the Reichsmotorschule and the NSKK, uh, which trained Germany's tank drivers and some of their crews. Uh, you could, as, as we see there in the bottom left-hand one, they took off the machine guns, took out the main gun, because that way you could get uh, an instructor easily into the turret area. Um, and these were widely used as training vehicles. The On the far right, you can see five Panzer 38s lined up. Uh, the first one has got its main gun, the other four haven't, and none of them have got the machine guns. I thought I'd save people the, the uh, difficulty of trying to sort of stick their nose up on their screen and look at what's what on there. Uh, in the background, you've got some Panzer 1s, which are also uh, converted into training vehicles. And in the middle, you've got one which has had its uh, uh, turret removed and been inspected by an American GI in 1945. Next slide, please. Now, some were actually mothballed, it would seem, um, because they start appearing in the last few months of the war. And they're appearing being used by units which would not naturally be employing these tanks uh, as part of their organization. A um, couple of examples there. The 416th Infantry Division in uh, Western, Fr uh, sorry, Eastern France, 19, at the end of 1944, they had at least two Panzer 38s. There's a photograph of another one. Um, so they were, it's an infantry division and it's using uh, light tanks, which is not something you would normally expect. And again, on the right, March 1945, we're now into the final weeks of the war. This tank appears uh, with the insignia of the 78th Volkssturm Division in Czechoslovakia. And <clears throat> if you're looking at that and thinking you wouldn't want to be the commander in that tank, I think you're probably right. Uh, that's a rather nasty uh, smash on the back. Next slide, please. But it didn't just stop at tanks. As some of you will be aware, um, the Germans were very apt at putting redundant turrets on top of concrete bunkers and using them as defensive devices. Uh, probably, obviously, um, in Normandy, Paul, you, you would have seen some of these, if not with the turrets still on them, at, at least the, the bunkers are still there. Uh, the, more f the most famous ones are probably the Panther turrets, which were used in Italy. Uh, to mm. great success. But again, the little Flamingo flamethrower tank, the turrets which were taken off of those were reused as bunker tops, uh, as were the Panzer 38s and various other tank prototype uh, turrets. Uh, 351 of these are used. You can still find some of these today. There's one down near the Spanish border in France, uh, and there are, I think, at least a couple in Norway, if not more. But these were used not only on the Atlantic Wall, uh, in France, up into Norway, but also in Greece and in, in Eastern Europe also. Uh, at least 127 were taken from some of these obsolete vehicles, most probably from those which are actually converted into the Marder threes. And that takes us back to our summary, I think, if I remember correctly. So there we go. So that is the analysis that I came up with. Now, as you can appreciate, that. So 244, I've got the end. I think that should be 284. Um, I've just spotted my own typo there. Um, so what we've seen there is a, an example of a German tank, the Panzer 38. It sees a lot of service, um, but by the time the Germans realise it's it's no longer a viable as a, as a frontline vehicle, they then take it. <clears throat> take it back and then it's used for various other uses and what we've seen is uh, a fairly good display of what Germans did with their obsolete tanks 
to actually get the most out of them to give you know to extend their <clears throat> useful life albeit a useful life which doesn't necessarily mean staying as a tank and if we go to the last slide I'll take any questions that anybody's uh, anybody may have. Well, I mean, I will jump in first while people are collecting their thoughts. Thank you very much. That was absolutely outstanding, Pete. Uh, I knew it would be. Um, is there any conclusions we can draw about the kind of going back to the economics idea of this, the expenditure and cost of this? I mean, it, 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 what ifs are very very difficult to, to, to you know to extrapolate from, but you know, and it, we know the internet is full of all the prototypes the Germans developed of armored vehicles, which is another separate subject. But and we obviously know they lost the war, so we can we can we can draw some conclusions from that. But this this recycling process using the Panzer thirty eight as a case study, what you know, score it out of ten in its effectiveness. I mean, it was what what is your opinion? Was it did they do the best they could given the circumstances they had? Given you know what else could they have done? So give it give it a score. Um, you're probably looking at a seven or eight out of ten, I would say. Um, it's a very complex subject because, you know, if you want to, I, I used one particular vehicle and I used it for, you know, I used that vehicle for the reasons I've given, but mm. the reason I only looked at one vehicle and not at the whole extent is that it's a very complex subject. And there are various factors in there. Um, time is a factor. At the beginning, the Germans didn't have spare chassis, so they used their redundant Panzer ones to build their first conversions. Um, it's only really when you get to the Panzer threes that they, you know, in a, they come into a similar uh, period where um, tank production is starting to be affected by Allied bombing. You've got these redundant vehicles. You haven't yet got the designs for, say, the recovery tank based to be based on the Panther. So rather than um, rather than wait for the chassis to become available, you use what you've got. So if you like, it's almost a bit opportunist. You know, you, you've got to take advantage of what you've got at any set time. Um, and it is a wide area. Um, you know, you've got the French Boiter Panzers, you've got the, the Soviet stuff, you've got the Italian vehicles. Um, you know, and you've got varying levels of capacity. Um, I mentioned about taking the factory, the factories taking back tanks um, to be repaired, and that worked well up until the end of 1941 when the whole thing fell apart because they were given the, the order priority number one, build new tanks, priority number two, if you can, spare parts. And when you're being faced, you're being told to produce new tanks, you can't sp spare the resources to start bringing back into your factories tanks which have been heavily damaged in the field and then applying your, your scant resources to those as well so it it's a very it, personally i find it a very interesting topic it's also very complex and is certainly it's worth at some point i'll, I'll go back and look at it at a much wider scale than just focusing on one model which, yeah, you know, even though it does give us a very good flavour for what the Germans did, um, it doesn't capture the whole picture and the whole. No, I think from my limb, I'm not a tank head. I'm not, a, you know, I'm not an armour guy. But it seems to me the Panzer 38 is a fairly neutral tank to look at in the terms of it's not painting one side of the story or the other. If if we took the Panzer three and the Stug, for example, that probably for my limited is is probably the biggest success story of a of a conversion adaptation process but there will be others that are really bad examples so it seems to me you've chosen one that sort of sits in that kind of even area where it is a useful case study that's representative across this way but we'll do a couple of questions so phil blood's first is did older versions of the newer tanks get recycled and i realize this could be a massively large potential rabbit hole uh, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you answer that in as in as few or as many words as you like <laughs> So did older versions of newer tanks uh, get recycled? Um, well, the one that I mentioned in the uh, presentation was the Sturm Tiger. So the, the Tiger tank, the, the Tiger One, which appears in 1942. By 1944, it's phased out in favor of the, the, the Tiger Two. Um, and 
yes, 18 of those were converted into uh, the Sturm Tiger. Just trying to think what if there was anything else on the Tiger One chassis. Uh, can't think offhand. Um, but in terms of recycled Panthers, Panzer Fours, I mean, Panzer Fours, again, you know, that was a tank which began the war and ended the war. It's still being produced at the yeah. end of the war. Um, but again, uh, that was also recycled. I mean, if you look at the Panzer IV that they've got in the Bovington Tank Museum, that was a perfect example. It's a D version built in 1940. And at some point, which I'm not quite sure what point, probably around 1942, 43, that was given a longer gun. It was given the, the Schutzen skirt armor, uh, wider tracks, bigger sprocket wheels, etc. So that was um, upgraded, if you like. So, yes, it did happen, uh, but possibly on a smaller scale. Okay. That was a nice, fairly concise answer. So Sheldrake is asking, um, which was the most effective conversion adaptation of the 38 in Pete's view? Effective versions from a timing point of view, I would say the early Marders, right? Okay, uh, principally because at that time Germany had no effective, apart from the 88 millimeter flat guns, the flat 16, uh, 18s, and 36s, and 37, it had no weapon which could easily defeat a KV 1 or T 34 in, in late 41. 40, uh, early 42. It wasn't until they got uh, the 7.5 centimeter anti tank guns or the rechambered Soviet 76 millimeter anti tank guns onto a Marder chassis um, that the Germans actually had vehicles that could take on and defeat the, the T 34. So, in my book, I would say at that time, they probably had the biggest impact. They were the most effective. There are you could argue that later vehicles were affected for other reasons, but for me, that that's that's what I would choose. Richard Trainer is asking, and I'm guessing this particularly means the 1,296 original model. Did any of these particular tanks get used in service after the end of the Second World War? And the answer to that is yes. Um, some were left behind in Yugoslavia. They were on the armored trains. They were taken into the uh, Yugoslavian army. And there, there are photographs of these vehicles with Yugoslavian flags on them. In fact, there's a book there I've got here um, uh, full of those. Um, so, yes, the Yugoslavians used them. And also the Czechoslovakian army until the early 1950s also used them because obviously uh, they still had the factory and they still had some of these vehicles kicking around. And what was interesting is there's even a picture of a Hetzer. Uh, even though this is not a 38 as such, a Hetzer with a dirty great crane on it. It looks like a, a normal factory crane then, until you look at the tracks on the wheels. So, yes, these tanks were used by at least two armies after the war and some of the vehicles also. Well, brilliant. Well, I think my last question is kind of more about bringing up the idea of historiography and how this idea, because Phil Blood was saying that he's sure he's read that that these the, the Panzer Third Eights were converted in, into uh, into Hetzers, and as we've now found out, it was the later improved chassis that were made into Hetzers. So the question is kind of, as someone who has a good understanding of the armor, but you're also pretty read, good, well read about the operations and the battles as well. Without naming any names of historians, there there it seems to me there are the armor books for the armor heads, and then there are kind of the battle books for the battle fans and there perhaps isn't enough collaboration between the two because i can see what would happen is that a primary source that said yes uh panzer 38s were then a later model was then converted into a headser by the time that gets repeated a couple of times and the language gets changed down it becomes uh, 38s were were converted into into you know into headsers so it's a it's a it's a Chinese whispers kind of telephone game version of of, yeah. of a fine primary source becoming a secondary source becoming repeated. So, and that would seem to me that people who are writing these kind of operational studies might need to pay a bit more attention to those kind of Panzer tracks kind of books that you have. But then then that's the case for every historian having to then do they then look into small arms? Do they look into aircraft types because that's the difficulty of if you're doing a, a single volume book about a battle, 
how long do you spend checking every detail? But my question, my, at the end of that long ramble by me, my kind of question is going to be, you know, should there be more collaboration? Should should the kind of authors writing the operational studies have a better grip of armor production, armor armor models? I would say yes. This sounds like a sit on the fence type of answer. I would say yes it's and no. Right. If if you if you're going to write a book on the Battle of X and you start mentioning the, the tank types, well, okay, fine. The more detail you start to use in your history pure or purer history book um you know the more detail you get into the more you need to actually read up about what you're writing um you know a lot of as we now know a lot of the history about the second world war which was written in the 60s 70s 80s etc um was based upon what was known at the time or based upon assumptions. Mm -hmm. People looked at the Hetzer, they looked at the Panzer 38 and said, oh, it's the same same vehicle. Look at the, look at the tracks, look at the wheels. And to a certain extent, yeah, they're kind of right. However, it's not until you get your tape measure out or your caliper and you start measuring these things, you go, hold on, these wheels are actually slightly bigger, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So yes, um, going back to your question, if you're going to get into the detail, technical detail in about the history book about a certain battle you need to make sure that that detail is solid yeah i mean it, it's a kind of thing that if the general reader if they're re if that's kind of a throwaway comment if, a, if a someone is saying in the battle of x hetzers were employed by the so-and-so unit against this and they got sustained so-and-so number of vehicles knocked out and they knocked they held up this regiment for the x number of hours and a footnote says these were converted from Panzer 38 to in a war, that doesn't actually change the ending of that passage. It doesn't change the the, the, the conclusion the author has said is that these tanks were lost. It, it provided this six delay, hour delay on the battlefield. That that hasn't changed. It's just a detail that someone who does know their arm will go, yeah, that's a bit, a bit of a problem there. But then every one of us who is trying to be an all-rounder, I'm trying to be an all-rounder in these, in these shows, I'm inevitably can't be I can't be as good as my guests on every one of the subjects I cover. It would be it would be impossible for me to do that. Yeah. So that's why I, in my case, what I try and do is I defer to the person who knows more about it. But then if you're doing a book and then you defer, if you send your book out to an armor expert, an aviation expert, and an economy expert, and a so-and-so expert, you know, how long would that process take? You know, for them to all read it and then submit their thing. So it's it's a complicated subject. Um, and and it, but it, the point is. It's good to talk about. Indeed. Indeed. And on that subject, on that note, I think we will end things. And I, I'm going to extend the invitation to you now on camera so you can't kind of back out. I'd <laughs> like to see you come back at some point in the future and do a Stug sh show because I think there's some real value there because everyone everyone knows that the Stugs had a really good big influence on numerous theatres and whether that would be a single the Stug as a as a, as a as an overall concept or the Stug in one theatre or the Stug in one but that that the Stug has been on my radar for a long time as a really good uh, ex uh, subject to get involved in but not just from the kind of armor angle, but from the operational angle and the kind of popular myth angle as well, because you know it came up in the show with Anthony Tucker Jones in the sidebar about whether it's an assault gun or uh, or a self-propelled gun or whether it's a so and so and how it's being used and people have opinions about that and 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 there, yet there's actual documentation supporting versions. So uh, if that's you're nodding there, so um. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to get you. I'm not, I'm not going to get you to commit something, people. I'm going to throw that idea your way and, and, and ask okay. you to think about that. So I'm going to. That's what I'm going to do. I'll, I'll take that as a challenge. Brilliant. And there's no rush. You know, and next week will be fine. No, brilliant. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. So right, that was really good. So I'm just going to take you off screen for a second, and I'll bring you back in a second. So folks, we have one more show finishing off Germans at War, which will, is a really good conclusion to our evening. So that is going to be a look at how the Germans have commemorated their war dead. And I'm expecting people to raise their eyebrows at that because, as I said at the end of yesterday's show um, with Mike, Michael Stout, that, you know, everyone watching this, they're aware of Commonwealth War Graves and the Poppy Appeals and British Legion and the work of the ABMC and all those things like that. But I think most of us who are watching this, we're English speaking, at least if not our first language, our second language, 
And considering the fact the Germans lost a lot of people in World War II, and of course we're not denying the Holocaust, of course we know that the SS were responsible for some terrible crimes, as were the Wehrmacht, as were the Luftwaffe, but I think a show with a German historian explaining how the Germans commemorated their war dead is going to be really interesting. So that is tomorrow night's show, 7 p.m. UK time. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to learning a lot about that. So um, give Lisa Marie a chance to kind of explain her, uh, her, her findings because I think it'll be interesting. So there we are. I'll bring Pete back in just to say goodbye. And um, yeah, have you enjoyed talking to our little bunch of people? We, we overran a little bit, but I don't care because it was fantastic. Thank you. No, it's been it's been great. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Brilliant. Super. Well, this is it. This is Paul Wood for World War II TV. I will see you all again tomorrow. And thank you very much for watching. And thank you very much, Pete, for your fantastic presentation. Cheers, everybody. Bye.